I think that people are really impressed by and really love things where, um, you know, you can get something for doing absolutely nothing. Um, so for Welltree, it manifests as things like, uh, you know, maybe we can pull your heartbeat data directly from your Apple Watch and interpret it in a very beautiful way that is unique and different every time and changes depending on how your body feels. Um, I think that people uh, are really kind of like mesmerized by those things where I think that's why people get addicted, you know, to um, TikTok or Instagram or Facebook because you don't have to do anything. Uh, in those apps, you open them and every time it's something new, delightful, it's personalized, especially for you, um, stuff like that. I think that, um, I think it was a couple of years ago when we changed our onboarding and we actually called it a magical onboarding uh, because what it did is like people would sign up uh, and then we would show them how their wellness kind of changed over the course of the past month uh, in colors. Uh, you know, from green to red or from red to green uh, over the course of the past month. And people uh, were, uh, I think our conversion rates shot up like 20% because mm. people really love these kinds of magical things. You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. Uh, I was out at a, a conference recently and had a chance to meet Asaya Polony, who is a product manager at Welltory, which is a health app. And the, the reason I was super excited to talk to her is, you know, app developers are often balancing different priorities around like what is the app's monetization strategy and how do they balance off things between charging for certain features and not charging for other features and making it freemium and then ad supported. And then if it is ad supported, you know, there's all sorts of decisions around that. And I just uh, thought it'd be like a fun conversation to have because as the e-marketing association, um, you know, servicing both sides of the publisher and advertiser ecosystem, I think it'd be fun to sort of get into your your mode of thinking. So thanks so much for, for joining me on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Yeah. And so for those of you, who, those folks who don't know your app and what, what your app does, maybe give us sort of a reader's digest of the app and how many installed users it has and whether or not it has a freemium element to it or not. Uh, sure. Yeah. So let me try a pitch that I haven't tried before. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, so Welltree is an all-in-one wellness app uh, that tricks you into taking better care of your health without you even noticing. Um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think I'm going to try to sell it like this now. Um, <laughs> so uh, basically, what Welltree does is it pulls uh, a bunch of data from different apps and gadgets, uh, and then it interprets it for different insights to tell to let you know how your body is responding to everything that happens to you. Uh, and kind of it works better the more sources you think and the more trackers you have, the more data you connect. I think you can connect like uh, up to 1,200 different sources. Uh, and like you know, the more you connect, the more interesting it gets, the more analysis you have uh, and right. stuff like that. Um, I think what makes us different from most health apps is that we really don't try to not tell people what to do. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we try not to give people like goals to meet or give them like little tasks. Uh, we just kind of prefer to let people's own bodies uh, guide them to better health. Uh, we really believe that the better you're connected to your body, the better decisions you're going to make uh, about your health behavior and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a bit of a wild ride, uh, but a very successful one. <laughs> Uh, we have um, about 8 million users, I, I think uh, even more than that at this point. Uh, and, uh, yes, I think, did I, does that answer all of your questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the other question would be, you know, is it, is it mostly pay, paid or is it, is there a freemium version as well? And if there is a freemium version sort of, I'd love to also hear how you went through deciding, you know, whether there would be a freemium version or not. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes, so uh, because we're dealing with uh, people's health data, uh, we're really, really careful about uh, data privacy uh, and sort of uh, because of this, we uh, immediately said, no, we're not going to ever sell people's health data, share it for profit, anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, our business model is strictly people pay us so that we can give them insights based on their data. We don't advertise them any strange, weird things. Uh, we don't give their data to anyone else. So it is a freemium model. You get some things for free. Uh, I think our general strategy is if it's something that we genuinely think can help save people's lives, then it should be free. Mm -hmm. um, so something like we have these um, we have these camera measurements when people can take a heartbeat measurements, and they give you like very beautiful interpretations of like your stress insights, uh, how much energy level you have, kind of like if you should take it easy that day. Uh, but I, our general model is if uh, there's a, we spot that there might be a genuine risk to your health, uh, that should be free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a yeah. great uh, philosophy to have uh, with yeah. regards to that. Um, and uh, sort of uh, one of the things is in a product management hat that you're wearing, right? You have to decide from the connectivity to device perspective, like which which things do you add to the next list, right? So there's certain sort of obvious ones like Apple Watches, but then there may be less obvious ones like if there's continuous glucose monitors and there's seven top brands, right? Do you try to integrate with only the top two? Do you try to, you know, how do you make the decision mm -hmm. as, as far as what you're what you're tapping into? Because I would imagine each each one of those may pose its own challenges with regards to some are easy to integrate in with and others are quite challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that um, what makes things a bit easier for us uh, is that uh, a lot of uh, companies, when they make these devices, they make them so that they're immediately you can integrate them with your Apple Health. Uh, and mm -hmm. because we integrate with Apple Health, uh, we kind of can grab the data as long as the, you know, the person is comfortable sharing the data with us. Obviously, we always ask for permission, but we can just integrate directly with Apple Health and get most things from there. Um, and right. it's also easier for it's easier for users because you don't want to be integrating 5,000 different devices <laughs> <laughs> separately. Uh, right. So yeah, I would say that uh, by default, all things that integrate with uh, Apple Health get priority. Uh, they're gonna be integrated with us faster. Uh, and then everything else is kind of, um, we try to look at uh, our user base and our user base is mostly people who are not uh, like very hardcore athletes. Uh, or people who are very sick. It's mostly people somewhere in the middle. Uh, so uh, if those people, uh, if we have like a massive user base that's using one tracker or the other, we will try to integrate with it. Uh, but like I said, most of those trackers integrate with Apple Health anyway. Uh, and right. sometimes you just don't need a direct integration at all. Right. And uh, so what has been your Android strategy then, given the fact that I, I don't think Apple Health has an Android app <laughs> it does not. Uh, so Android Android has its own aggregators. I wish you could talk to our Android product manager because he knows <laughs> uh, infinitely more about this than I do. Uh, we have a wonderful integration uh, with Samsung Watch for the Android app uh, where it's kind of um, like it, it does the same thing as uh, our Apple, our iOS app uh, does with Apple Watch, where it can just like grab data directly and generate an entire feed of insights for you um, automatically. But Android also has a lot of health aggregators. Like there is uh, Google Fit. Uh, there is um, so we integrate with all of those aggregators as well. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, once is it sort of a very one of the things that uh, people who are app developers are super focused on is sort of stickiness, right? They don't want churn. They don't want a person trying an app and then saying, oh, it didn't provide enough value, right? And you mm -hmm. sort of think about people's home screens on either an Apple mm -hmm. phone or a Samsung phone for that matter, right? Is there's certain things that you know are going to be there pretty much forever once they decide that they're either an Uber or a Lyft customer, they'll mm -hmm. leave that there. Maybe they'll leave them both there like I do, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, stickiness of the app is, is super key. So as you're sort mm -hmm. of planning out things and you want to make sure that it's sticky, that sort of means you need to delight them right away, potentially even while they're still in the freemium mode, right? So, right. you know, how do you think through that, uh, that you know, 
make sure that it's got some, like a super easy learning curve and they can sort of delight them right away. Is there is there mm -hmm. a general best practices around that? Well, so let me uh, let me kind of separate that question into into two. So I I do say a lot of people say uh, you know retention and stickiness are like super important. If you don't have them, you don't have a product. You don't have an app. <laughs> um, and in the in kind of the health tech and the and the wellness tech space, I'm not sure I fully ag agree with that because you have. Um, so I was quitting smoking. Uh, thankfully successfully and I had this app to help me quit smoking and if you are making that kind of app and you have like a really good stickiness and really good retention you're not doing a good <laughs> exactly. yeah it's a good point <laughs> you're not really doing a good job I mean it might not be like uh, the best for a building a long-term company if you're building a product where your ultimate goal is to have the user churn uh, but yeah so I, I don't I don't actually think that all products need to be need to be like really focused on retention and stickiness. Um, it's definitely our focus at Welltree because I don't think you can actually help people continuously lead healthy lives unless you're with them like every step of the way. Um, right. So stickiness and retention are really important for us. I think that um, man, a lot of my a lot of my coworkers uh, aren't into uh, this idea as much as I am. But I really think that the key to long-term retention uh, and stickiness um, is magic. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is that I think that people are really impressed by and really love things where, um, you know, you can get something for doing absolutely nothing. Um, so for Welltree, it manifests as things like, uh, you know, maybe we can pull your heartbeat data directly from your Apple Watch and interpret it in a very beautiful way that is unique and different every time and changes depending on how your body feels. Um, I think that people uh, are really kind of like mesmerized by those things where I think that's why people get addicted, you know, to um, TikTok or Instagram or Facebook because you don't have to do anything. Uh, in those apps, you open them, and every time it's something new, delightful, it's personalized, especially for you, um, stuff like that. I think that um, I think it was a couple of years ago when we changed our onboarding, and we actually called it a magical onboarding uh, because what it did is like people would sign up, uh, and then we would show them how their wellness kind of changed over the course of the past month uh, in colors. Uh, you know, from green to red or from red to green uh, over the course of the past month. And people uh, were, uh, I think our conversion rates shot up like 20% because mm -hmm. people really love these kinds of magical things. Uh, so I think if you can figure out how to deliver value to users without them ever having to do a single thing, uh, I think that's, uh, that's probably the key to long-term retention and stickiness, or it has been for us. Right, right. Some people will tell you it's gamification, but <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, do Do you find that there that uh, in when you look at the data in aggregate that there have been some really really interesting um, aha moments when when you look at the you know exercise levels or activity levels or sleep levels. Where obviously mm -hmm. it's all proprietary information and super private, but you, you know you mm -hmm. you may be able to look at things in aggregate and get some really interesting information. Did you get any surprises uh, just from your particular user base or you've never really felt the desire or, or, or need to look at that information? I look at that information all the time, but once again, aggregated, uh, yeah, right. never, never at individual uh, data. Uh, I, I will brag a little. I'll take this opportunity <laughs> to brag a little bit. Um, <laughs> so we have found, uh, we, we do internal research and we do find that when people start um, using the app after about uh, a month or two months sometimes, uh, we measure people's stress levels based on their heartbeat. And we see that their stress levels go down by about 10%, uh, which is really cool. And people also start, uh, they add an average of 20,000 steps more to their like monthly step count. Uh, they start getting more exercise and they actually start sleeping 20 minutes more uh, per night. Uh, on average, which I think is really cool. Uh, so those are kind of uh, some of the, I think that's 
probably the coolest insight that we've um, gleaned from uh, our users' data over the long term. Right, right. Um, the one of the other challenges you probably face internally is uh, obviously you don't want to give you want to give people the tools to be healthier, but mm -hmm. you don't necessarily want them self-diagnosing and then not engaging with a healthcare provider. Right. Absolutely. And so how yep. do you find that balance, right? Between mm -hmm. I want to give people a dashboard, I want to give people insights, I want to sort of delight them with it with my user experience, but I don't want them to say, you know, to either uh, overdiagnose or underdiagnose something. Yeah, yeah. Not go to a doctor when they should have, or go to a doctor mm -hmm. when it's something so minor that it didn't need to didn't require a doctor visit. Yeah, I think this is the problem uh, or, or kind of, a, I don't want to say problem, a challenge for health tech uh, generally. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with um, with Dr. Mike, he talks about this a lot, how a lot of times these uh, these health trackers are actually giving giving people more health anxiety <laughs> right? uh, because people, people tend to like over monitor and then like the device is glitched, like sometimes in the middle of the night, it says my heart rate is like 160. And I've been working in health tech for a while. I know it's not 160. I know it's like I'm yeah, having so a device. If, if your watch tells you you're dead and you're not actually dead, it's probably wrong, right? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had my heart rate be zero a couple of times. And I was like, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm not dead. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really, really fine line to cross, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we, uh, to not cross, um, uh, which is why we really stay away from medical advice and we strictly work in terms like um, stress, energy, uh, kind of pressure on your body because our guiding philosophy is your body kind of responds to everything you do and kind of adjusts the way it, like your heart rate behaves, your blood pressure, uh, stuff like that. All of that changes depending on what's happening around you. Um, and our job is just to show people how things are affecting them. It's not to diagnose and be like, oh, you're having like a cardiac incident or something like that. Right. Um, it's just it's just to uh, to show them how different things affect how their body is behaving. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned gamification and obviously the mm -hmm. gamification of health would be a really sort of odd thing. But then again, some folks, particularly competitive athletic folks would love to gamify everything right i mean they, they mm -hmm. would love to have uh you know biofeedback sessions to see whose heart rate can go lower or whatever right so of course. you know do have have any stories come up of where people are in fact trying to sort of make it fun or, or in, in ways mm -hmm. that were unexpected i think uh actually we all uh engage in some kind of health gamification every day because uh you know there's the apple watch has famously those rings uh and people try to like really try to close them <laughs> uh and i think that uh, uh welterry experience is sort of the same thing like uh people take measurements uh and try to like i i am guilty of this too i try to like meditate before i take a measurement because i'm really into getting um <laughs> these um the, these beautiful uh blue uh like fuel tanks um, so I think, uh, I think, yeah, there's like, there's a bit of an element of gamification to it. When you start getting feedback from your body, you want it to look as good as possible. Mm -hmm. So then you start doing things to get like a better result. And sometimes people do this subconsciously. Um, sometimes like in my case, I do it very consciously. <laughs> right. Do, do, have you found that people are sometimes just also comparing with each other, right? Yeah. In peer groups as well, you know, to sort of yes. say, oh, you know, what what is what are your what is your graph look like or whatever it is yeah yeah we actually even um we have uh an integration with slack uh that kind of uh you can have um a little weltery icon next to your name that kind of like continuously monitors your stress level throughout the day uh and some people you know aren't comfortable sharing that information with their coworkers, obviously right but some people are super into that because they don't want people messaging them if they're like in the red stress level um, right you know? <laughs> or, or pointing the finger like see what you did to me i was that was yes. green this morning until you called yes. right exactly <laughs> yeah that's, um, it's, it's really interesting um 
you know, I I, I just da I downloaded the app. I haven't had a chance to experiment with it yet, but I will absolutely be experimenting with it now. Uh, I think for for you know everyone would everyone would agree that you know health is super important. And I, I, it's great that you you found a category where you you know do have a freemium model that uh, allows people to have a positive impact on their health before they take their credit card out. Um, mm -hmm. Have you found that there are certain triggers? Uh, with regards to the data that that act as conversion rate triggers, um, e either an amount of time on the app or certain types of, you know, additional features or functionality that that particularly for other product developers that have nothing to do with health might, you know, help them think about how do we how do we trigger that 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 bump up from freemium into paid. Mm -hmm. That's hard to say because for us it's a very it's a really a very specific thing. Uh, if, if a person has um, either uh, a measurement that's already available in their Apple Watch, so when they sync it, we can interpret it and really show them what the app is capable of, mm -hmm. or if they're able to take a successful like heartbeat measurement with the phone camera, uh, that we do that for people who don't uh, have an Apple Watch, um, mm -hmm. they can just like take it manually. Uh, and as soon as they see how extensive the heartbeat analysis is, again, how magical it is. Um, they tend to uh, convert to paying customers um, a lot more readily. Or if they don't convert at that uh, moment, we actually, um, unlike most health apps that uh, really sell, do most of their sales on day one, uh, we have good retention of free customers uh, compared mm -hmm. to the benchmarks. Uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, a real number because I'm afraid I'll, I won't get it quite right. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's. And a lot of times people uh, stick around and continue taking measurements and convert m much later on, mm -hmm. um, which I think makes us very different. But it, yeah, it's really about that uh, uh, taking just like a really short heartbeat measurement and turning it into something very elaborate and insightful uh, and magical. Uh, that, that's what it is for us. Right. Uh, I would imagine that the user base that you've got, there are quite a few healthcare providers in your user base. Potentially, they even over-index, right? Because they may be a little bit more focused on health than the average person. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious whether you get interesting feedback from that community, uh, either mm -hmm. glowing or product recommendations for the next, mm -hmm. next go-around. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we actually have, uh, we, uh, have a, an entire health science team uh, so we actually like uh, work uh, with a physician. Uh, she writes all of our algorithms that interpret like people's heartbeat data um, and uh, workout analytics and stuff like that. Uh, but we do get a lot of interesting uh, feedback because a lot of our body analytics in the app is based on heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we find actually a lot of that feedback to be quite helpful. Uh, just recently, we had a very interesting conversation. I believe it was with a physician. It was like right on our Twitter, um, who was like, you know, you guys uh, keep interpreting these heart rate variability measurements, but lots of things can uh, uh, impact your heart rate variability. And you can't really have um, diagnostics that are that precise and accurate from one single measurement. Uh, and we kind of thought about this feedback. Uh, we were like, okay, this is uh, true in some ways. And then we thought, okay, maybe we can uh, have that analysis that people love, but also improve it and kind of look at a history of people's measurements and try to make it like a bit more stable and a bit more accurate. Uh, so yeah, we do get feedback from uh, the healthcare provider community, the medical community, and we improve our algorithms all the time based on that feedback. Right, right. Well, there are certain uh, data points that, probably aren't um, as they're certainly not readily available within the Apple watch itself or the Samsung watch itself. But, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are these new sort of digital body accessories like continuous glucose monitors and things along those yeah. lines. Do you sort of feel like the, 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 the continued adoption of those types of body monitoring technologies is also sort of a tailwind for you and that as people get more and more information into their devices, right? You, you, your app becomes more and more valuable because it's got more data flowing into it. Yeah, of course, uh, of course. There's actually uh, there's a wonderful book about this. Um, it's called The Age of Scientific Wellness. Uh, I can't, I can't, unfortunately, I can't remember um, 
Larry Hood, and then there's one other guy. I think there's two or three authors. Um, and they were talking uh, about how, you know, the best way to get people to take care of their health um, is to monitor all of these things continuously. Uh, and kind of the more data you have, uh, the more you can help people. And I think that's where Welterese Future is, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, uh, is this continuous monitoring. And then the more data you have, uh, the more precise and personalized the recommendations can be. Does um, machine learning and AI factor heavily into sort of the next generations of the software that you guys are, are putting out? Of course. Uh, so, yeah, we, we kind of, I think we were doing a lot of AI before it was cool, honestly. I think that <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, the story of how I ended up at Welltree to begin with, uh, because I was not a tech person uh, as a copywriter. Um, and translator. And I was doing a lot of um, copywriting for Welltree. And then we ended up making this basically generative AI machine um, where uh, we could basically, uh, we basically made a system that generates infinite content based on how your data changes throughout the day. Um, so I, I think that was like our, our, our little MVP, like generative AI. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy there's a real one. <laughs> Uh, because maintaining ours was like not a good time for me, uh, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but I think that uh, now that generative AI is a thing and we're getting more and more data, uh, so much more sense uh, of this data can be made uh, by these ML and AI techniques. Uh, and it just wasn't possible even a year ago. Uh, and I'm, I'm super excited to see where it's headed. Right, right. Cool. Well, th thanks so much for sharing uh, the, the journey that you've been on and the like little epiphanies uh, from a product management perspective. I think other folks building apps or, or you know, also the people on their own health journeys will, will get a lot out of it. I appreciate you joining me on the, the podcast. Of course. Thank you so much. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe, or follow.